Rod? Present. You? Pat Brown? Here. Terry Burrell? Present. Thank you. Sue Kate? Present. Anne Marie Gillis? Present. Greg Grimes? Here. Aaron Hall? Present. Thank you. Emery Viska? Do we have Emery? No. No? Rhonda Rhonda Jubinville? Do we have Rhonda? No. Frank Kenner? Here. Adam Kilner? Present. Thank you. Betty Ann McKinnon? Present. Don McCabe? Yep. Don McCallum? Right. Um, Mary Lynn McCallum? Present. Steve Miller? Present. Ross O'Hara? Present. Kristen Rodriguez? Present. Lori Scott? Present. Terry Westgate? Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, just uh, my remarks before we get started. Uh, I believe everyone would be aware that uh, Director Larry Gordon passed away on March 17th of 2023. Uh, Larry served on the board of directors representing the village of Point Edward for seven years, three of which he served as vice chair. Larry was a strong supporter of the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority, who always provided thoughtful points in the discussion in his signature broadcaster's voice. He will be greatly missed. On behalf of the St. Clair Conservation, flowers were sent to Larry's family and a memorial tree will be planted in his memory. For those who would like to attend, a celebration of life will be held June 1st at the Seaway Kiwanis Pavilion in Cantera Park from 4 p.m. till 7 p.m. Also, uh, just an update that Brad Loosley is taking a temporary leave of absence from council to focus on a medical issue. Uh, Petrolia Councillor Ross O'Hare has been appointed as an interim director on the authority board. We wish Mary, Mayor Loosely good health and hope he is able to return to council soon. We welcome Ross O'Hare to the board of directors. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a delegation, and I think I'll address that item first uh, in regards to the uh, changes in our campgrounds and regulations for seasonal camping lots. And uh, in order to address the board, a majority vote is required. Um, like I say, the folks that come out, is there any motion to uh, hear that delegation? John Brennan. Pat, I'd like to praise the motion. Yes. Um, I move that the delegation be heard for a total of 10 minutes. And um, we will then um, understand that this will not be coming up at our next board meeting. Thank you. Okay, can I get a second for that? Jerry Westgate. All in favor of that motion. Okay, looks like uh, we have a majority of votes there. So I will ask the delegation. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Pete Fisher is going to speak on behalf of this site. If, uh, Part of my 10 minutes, sorry, starting. I was speaking on behalf of myself. I'm not on behalf of everybody because I'm from Camel. Uh, there's people from Warwick, people from Henderson. We have not got together and discussed this. I was speaking on behalf of myself, but I would still like to speak. Okay, point of order. I'd like to amend my motion then. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that uh, it, it, we, it, it, it was passed, but my understanding was that we were listening to a delegation for 10 minutes and not individuals in um, order of 10 okay. minutes each. So I'm wondering whether or not the board still wants to consider that. I, I guess I should ask how many people want to speak before the board if, uh, if we have the consensus of what the issue is and if one person puts it out that uh, for the directors to hear, we don't need to repeat it three times. I don't know if there other people that wish to address the board. Good, okay. So we'll we'll proceed.
proceed on that basis and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thank okay. you. Up front? Yeah.
So they had a third party risk management official come to our conservation area to do an assessment of our parks and liability. The one major item that was flagged was the nature of the structures at our seasonal campgrounds. So that's where that originally started. Uh, in terms of what liability? In terms of any type of lawsuit, because we're the owners of the property, the board carries that liability. So even if the individual campers have their own insurance, that doesn't matter in the court of law and in cases that go to, uh, so say someone has a catastrophic injury, falls off a deck, becomes incapacitated, the authority will be named in that lawsuit and that's part of the bigger liability and how these larger cases often work is whoever has the deepest pockets pays the most money. So that's the big liability that the authority carries with that. Um, so that's the nature of that liability that we carry. And that's why we had, this is why it was being brought forward now. Um, it's new information to us as a new general manager here, less than a year. Craig has had his position basically since COVID started. So we're just now getting into trying to address a lot of these issues that have been brought to staff's attention. Any other questions or comments from our board? Um, just a just a comment about the um, um, what Ken said about the liability. It was it was amazing to me. Like from council as a counselor, um, the the level of uh, the insurance uh, situation with as you say the the you know the, they go after the big guy. So even though they have their million dollar insurance, they definitely would still come after. The conservation authority and, and anybody involved, even if there was uh, the minimum um, involvement in that, it's who has the deepest pockets. That's for sure. Um, and I, I reread all of this again, um, and um, I, I, I'm reading it as there's three years to look after this. It's not something that has to be done immediately and and I understand that there won't be there's not a huge amount of people affected and that there will be a one one on one uh, basis with it all. So I just wanted to make the comment about the insurance because it was very eye opening when I learned all of that. Yeah, and Mr. Uh, Fisher did refer to the uh a report on that from Greg, which was uh, last month, 16.4. Uh, I think what still needs to happen as we're going through this is, uh, I believe, within two weeks, staff is going to be meeting with the individual on, on individual sites. They booked a couple days for each uh, different campground to review the issues. And I'm, from my understanding, I'm gathering that a lot of these issues are minor, okay, but for whatever sites they are fine that are in compliance, I'm sure we're willing to work with them, and uh, I think the timeline is generous at this point. So I don't know if, uh, uh, Mr. Phillips, if you have any more comments uh, as to, I know the dates have been established, I don't have them in front of me, but I, I do know the dates to visit the campgrounds are scheduled. So can I speak still, or am I finished? Okay. Let me address the other director's questions, please. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, just quickly, I read in the letter that somebody said that they were unable to obtain a building permit for their site because it's actually our property. Have we found a resolution to that, how they could comply on our property? So I'd have to refer to Greg in okay. handling the issue. Yeah, so I've spoken with both building departments, so we have two campgrounds very lacked in the seasonal camping and another in the middle site. Permits are able to be obtained with authorization of the authority. So the way it works is that whoever's constructing structure would seek the permit, but because we're the property owner, they wouldn't issue that permit without our, our authorization. Thank you. Uh, Anne-Marie Gillis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, being new to the board after a four-year absence, I'm just uh, getting up to speed. And one of the things that came to uh, my attention was um, did the AODA, um, the AOD compliant, AODA compliancy factor into any of these decisions? And did have we 
looked at the accessibility, or is that um, just not something that individual private camp owners have to deal with, and it's an overall author authority of, uh, direction? Perhaps staff can get a comment on that. I don't know if it means a private campsite uh, on our property. Go ahead, Greg. The AODA compliance wasn't a factor in the initial decision to look at this. As we've done our inspections, we have noted, as, as I go around the superintendents, we have noted a number, not a lot, less than a half dozen sites that we know have ramps and are at the, the deck is at the height of that for wheelchair purposes. And our recommendation that will come back to the board is that in those select circumstances, if we can determine the structure is reasonably built, has proper railings, we were looking at potentially seeing if the board would grandfather the site for those with a wheelchair issue. It, it, it's a tough one because it, they, they still don't meet building code. Uh, the other option is we can look at rebuilding those, those structures. Could it be rebuilt in a way that would allow for accessibility and be compliant? Uh, follow up? Um, yeah, just um, just one thing that comes to mind is when uh, the new laws came in, there was a lot of grandfathering that was allowed, particularly when it comes to railings. And uh, watching or listening, sorry, reading some of uh, the, the letters that came through, that was an issue uh, with regard to railing height. And I think the building code has changed it. Now it's 36 inches as opposed to 24. Is that correct? There's different height restrictions in the building code depending on the application. Uh, we, have, we have a variety of railing issues and it's not just height. We have missed railings, like decks that are three feet high or more with no railings. Okay. We have railings that are built but I don't think are necessarily secured properly as to the building code. We have railings that have top rail but there's nothing, there's no fall protection, there's no guarding to keep a child from falling out. So they, the challenges staff aren't necessarily equipped to make all these assessments based on building code, that's where the building permit system comes in. Mm -hmm. And we just, there's a fine line, you know, how do we determine what's safe and what's not? As staff, we're just not equipped to do that other than to say that we know certain structures are not building code compliant. And using that as our threshold, if we look at a different threshold, I think we would need to look at, I don't know who we could hire that would be willing to come in and say something safe when it's not. Building code compliance. I don't, I don't know how we can do that sort of teasing out what to grandfather and what not to. That, that's the challenge. There are some really well, like structures that look well built. There are some that look the opposite. They're in really poor condition and you can see some very obvious challenges with them. And then there's a big group in the middle. And, and we just aren't equipped to make those determinations of what we would want to grandfather without having that sort of expertise in the building code. And so that. with that, who does? Well, I think the part of the assessment that has to be done yet is you have to meet with the individual campers on their site, right, to so determine what. So I can clarify that the, the inspections that we have are already underway. When we go back out to each site to bring forward the concerns that we discovered, which is you've got a roof or you have a deck that's too high. In some cases, a deck has resolutions like it's an inch too high and it can be fixed with grading. In other cases, <coughs> a permit is required at 24 inches high, but you can be on deck blocks up to 24 inches to the bottom of the joist. So that leaves a little leeway where there are a number of decks that are too high to be built without a permit, but could be eligible for after the fact permits. But when that inspection happens, they're not just looking at the height. The inspector is now going to look at the entire construction. So it's going to be the camper's choice whether they would prefer to just lower it to a height where a permit is not required. Or they could go um, at two of the properties. So Lansing County has said they will issue after the fact permit. Okay. Middlesex did not want to. So two different organizations for the inspection. So I guess, Greg, my question is, is until you have the on-site meeting and to come up with a listing and which which ones require, I, I don't know how many have the accessibility issues, but there's so only a select few yeah. that are, are for wheelchair specific. Yeah. Uh, until we have that meeting, 
it's hard to go through. Everybody will have a better understanding of the process once we can meet meet with everybody individually. The decks to me are a more minor issue in that the majority can be modified or potentially can be grandfathered in with an after the fact permit. The roofs are the real sticking point. I don't see like there isn't a fix because they're on deck locks and the every building inspector is going to have considerable concern about uplift. So when coming underneath that roof and lifting it because it's not anchored in any way. And so the roofs are the real problem and the roofs are where people I know spend considerable money some and, and there I don't see a fix. I don't know how to grandfather them in knowing that they're safety concern. And that I guess is the decision of the board. But that that's the dilemma we come across is there's no way to make them building code compliant other than permitting hundreds of sites to cement them into the ground, which is something that we have never done. And the other I haven't seen a policy conservation authority seasonal camping policy that permits excavations because it's a lot of work. They're seasonal in nature. Although a lot of campers stay for a very long time, some come and go after a year or two, and it would be an incredible amount of work for us to, to remove all that structure ahead of the next camper, and it would essentially tear up the whole site for the next camper. So it becomes very challenging to permit after the fact permit on the roof. Lori Scott, I see you have your hand raised, so go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm I'm wondering about it as a conservation authority, it's it's the property um, and that we all own. So shouldn't I mean one of the things that we have to look at obviously is the safety issues that are out there conforming to whatever rules and regulations are are out there. But I think also as a group, um, we have to be consistent with what we allow in all the different areas and to make it easy for us for our insurance bases, if we have the same consistency throughout the campgrounds, then it makes it easier for us when we're talking to people to get quotes on insurance and things like that. So to me, this is uh, as, is really just us getting into uh, um, a better place. And the other thing is there's sort of a tenant, like we're the owners in the respect of, of the property and it's it's kind of a tenant um, relationship with the owners. So there has to be rules and regulations. So I really commend Greg for, for looking after it and for taking a, a case by case study and being able to go out and talk to the owners. Sometimes when people are um, worried about things like this, um, until they've actually sat and talked to the person one on one, they may find that the issues are not as bad as it, they seem. So I'm, I appreciate the gentleman coming and giving us um, his, his side of the story along with some of the other campers, but we really do as an authority have to make sure that we're following consistency, safety, and conforming so that it's easier for us to look after each of the properties and have consistent information to give to the people that we need to do. So thank you to both of you. Thanks, Greg, for the information and thank you to Mr. Fisher. Okay, I think um, we've uh, reached a point where we need to uh, move on from this until Greg has a chance to uh, come back to the board with uh, how his assessments went. And uh, I appreciate the delegation coming here today and uh, presenting their concerns. So um, I guess uh, I'll let one other person speak from the board if you got a question that we can deal with. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Um, my question is the reality of what I've just heard here this morning. Um, do we have people on the Conservation Authority who are, are going to be uh, uh, recognized by the insurance company to be risk uh, assessment people? And therefore, you're still not going to be in the same kettle of fish. If something goes wrong, you could still be found wrong, even though you're carrying insurance. Second of all, the uh, reality is that uh, which building code are you going to adhere to? And is that clearly documented that this is held to this permit? And therefore, once it's done, we're not going to be back there in another two years when another building code change comes along to adapt it to something new. 
I believe right now we've got a policy that's way in front of the horse. Okay, I think um, that's where Greg is working with the County of Lambton on getting permits issued, and he's mentioned that possibly some would be grandfathered as opposed to the ones that aren't compliant to whatever. But are you transferring the liability from the Conservation Authority to the County of Lambton by, their, by them having to send inspectors out? And therefore, why are we even into this realm of activity? It's the County of Lambton's job to do the permit, not ours. Greg, can you uh, clarify that, please? So, permits have not been issued on any of the structures. We've determined that permits were required. So if we were to go that route and grandfather those that could be permitted, that would be up to the county to, to determine who passes the inspection and who doesn't. And then once it's grandfathered, we as a, the board has a choice of looking at two options. It's either grandfathered indefinitely or it's grand, it would still be outside of our current policy so it could be grandfathered for the length of time for the current occupant and would still need to be addressed at a future date. That would be the direction we would ask for from the board is, you know, when we talk grandfather, is it, can they then sell their trailer and can that move on to the next occupant? Or is it grandfather only for that site occupant? That, that, the, like, I'll bring a, I can bring a report back in June with far more detail and we can uh, look at these issues at that time. Once I've had to meet on site with everyone. I think that's the way we need to go at this point and uh, until uh, Greg meets with the individual campers and uh, comes back to a further report uh, on what the issues are, there's a number of questions that have been raised, so I think it's uh, fair to give staff a chance to uh, look into and come back to the board with a follow-up on this once they've done their assessments. Okay. So we've done the adoption of the agenda. agenda or we're to we have done. Okay. I'm looking for a, a motion to uh, adopt the agenda, the remaining agenda for today. Uh, Anne Marie, and seconded by Frank. Oh, I missed that uh, item too, where the director declare a conflict of interest at the appropriate time on any item within this agenda in that the director may have a pecuniary interest. You usually read that there? No. no. Okay. So is this a done then for this part? Yeah, it's not it, you did your presentation and we we're and uh, you're free to go, yeah. Yes, sir. yeah. yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank okay. You. And I'm sure uh, we'll be hearing from Greg, and uh, hopefully uh, things we can we can resolve these things that semester. If we're going to know more in June, uh, what about those waivers? Will they be pushed for the end of June? Oh, for the compliance, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I believe it's Greg. It's till the fall of 2024. Oh, okay. This is for signing the waiver? Yeah. There's no, so the, the way the waiver is worded as if you need to sign it for the three year grace period, but you would still have this season. So there's no, you need to sign it by the end of the year if you want the three year grace period. You don't have to rush to do it. Okay. Tomorrow you have you okay. have time for us to start working through this process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where do you get the, the waiver, Greg? We, when we come site by okay. site with the letter, the waiver's on the back. Okay, well, we're looking forward to seeing you. Okay. Thank you for Okay, back to the agenda. Um, move, need a mover that the minutes of the Board of Directors meeting held on March 20, 10, 2023 be approved as distributed. Uh, Betty, I'll Lori move that. Scott and <laughs> seconded by Betty Ann. Yes. Thank you. Anyone opposed to that? Seeing none, I'll take that as being carried. Item 5.1. Need a mover for the 
that the Board of Directors acknowledge the presentation from Garish Sankar on the Water Resources Department. Over, please. Greg Grimes, seconded by Jerry Westgate. Any comments or concerns? Any opposed? I'll take that as being carried. Do you, do you need to speak to that, Gary? Yes. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Gary Stankar. I'm the Director of Water Resources. I want to spend a little bit of time in talking to you about the flood forecasting program and go over the uh, IQ dam and the operations and some of the roles and responsibilities. Uh, yeah. So, um, if you see the, uh, the watershed area right in the middle, it is the Sittenham River watershed area, and it has about 2,700 square kilometers of area draining into the community of Wallsford. So there are two main branches, called the North Branch and the East Branch, that needed Wallaceford and often subject to flooding. So in the 1970s, they had a simple principle that if you have two branches meeting in the community, just block one and divert it away, so you're just left with the east branch reaching the community. So that kind of reduced the flow amounts by approximately 40%. The north branch contributes 40%, the east branch contributes 50% which is the design philosophy of the McHugh Dam. It was built in the 1984 to prevent flooding in Wallaceburg, and it is approximately, it was designed to be operated once every six to 10 years. So that was the design element that went into the design of the McHugh Dam. I have some simple animation on the left. You see the gates that are being operated. Uh, one of the structural limitations is that these gates have to be operated in tandem. They go low together, they raise up together. These are very heavy and, and steel gates and approximately about five meters wide by seven meters in, in height, seven meters in length. Uh, the diversion channel, so as you operate the gate, the level upstream of the dam rises and it spills over a sill and it runs seven kilometers straight into the St. Clair River. It's a trapezoidal channel, it's a grass line channel that is maintained by our office on a regular basis. <clears throat> so in terms of the channel itself, it diverts approximately 50% of the water that comes in through the North Branch. But what happens to the other 50% is that it ponds upstream of the dam and it floods upstream properties. So what the office had done, what the Conservation Authority had done in the 1980s, it, it, it acquired expropriation certificates of those upstream lands that gave us the right to flood during flooding situations. And I have the properties, there are about 179 properties that we received expropriation certificates from. The ones that are shown in gray are the ones that the office was able to acquire as a part of that uh, acquisition strategy in the 19, uh, 1980s. The ones that are identified in white are the ones that we have expropriation certificates for. And we have about, uh, approximately about 140 to 150 properties that we have as well. In terms of our roles and responsibilities, what we are expected to do as an organization is that we are required to monitor the weather and watershed conditions throughout the year, uh, 24 hours per day, depending upon the rain falling out. And the role that we play is, uh, is an advisory role. We advise the municipalities, we advise the communities of the safety associated with a particular flooding event. Depending upon the type of rainfall we receive, one community may be exposed to flooding. 
and not another community. So we coordinate with the municipal staff and advise them about the potential road closures. We advise them about any of the the dams that are that are operated. We, we have uh, the few dams that we that we operate. So we keep the municipality informed of any road closures, of the emergency situation of, of flooding. We maintain and operate the McHugh floodway. And we have a satellite office and our McHugh foreman, Shane White, is stationed out of the McHugh Dam and he is primarily responsible for maintaining uh, the McHugh floodway. Another thing we do is we monitor the ice conditions along the river, depending upon the time of the year. We offer an advisory role to the municipality of Chatham Kent in not only on the condition of the ice, but also if there is an ice break, a potential ice jamming, potential and resulting flooding uh, because of that. We advise the municipality. The expectation from the municipality is that once they receive our information, they are able to act according to their emergency plan. They are able to deploy municipal services. Most often we see uh, road supers blocking the roads and barricading them and, and letting uh, the community know that these roads are flooded. So now that we've seen kind of the, the organizational roles of the project, I have a slide to show you how we do things internally in, in my department. Starting from left to right, uh, we have the water resources specialist, Emily Decloid, and her primary role is to maintain the stream gauges. So we have about 12 stream gauges across the watershed at strategic location that can speak to us and tell us what the water level is. So being at the office over the phone, you would know the water levels on an hourly basis. Not just the water levels, but also the rainfall amounts. How much of rainfall is coming? What is the risk to specific communities? We're able to learn all of that through the, the data monitoring uh, program that we have. And I will be talking to you about that in a bit. Another uh, uh, staff that we have is Shane White, is the McHugh Dam operator. He is at the satellite office at the McHugh Dam. And he is primarily responsible for the dam maintenance, the dam operation, field inspection. Our office, we're, we're pretty far uh, from Wallaceburg. And while uh, Emily and myself, we work on the data, we, we, we assess the threat associated with flooding, Shane is the one that is doing a lot of uh, site inspection and river monitoring. Uh, myself, Director of Water Resources, I am primarily responsible for flood forecasting based on the amount of rainfall. We're receiving municipal coordination. I'm talking to the, the municipal staff, telling them where the road closures are and how they can alert the community. And constantly evaluate the, the flooding conditions in Wall Street. And I have a slide to talk to you about the operating criteria. General Manager, Ken, uh, will receive and review our updates. Uh, he will coordinate with the chair. Uh, he'll also keep us in line um, and, and make, making sure we're doing what we're supposed to. And the responsibility of the chair, when it comes to the McHugh Dam operation, it is the, the primary responsibility of the McHugh Dam operation is, is, is relies on a decision of our chair. We provide him with all the, all the facts uh, and the recommendations and based on our finding, and it is the final decision from the chair to operate the McHugh plugin. So a little bit into the data monitoring. I know I've mentioned about the 12 stream gauges. So this is how we, we monitor. We, we observe the short range forecast, the midterm forecast, and the long range forecast. And we have different tools that we use. And on the left is, is a small animation that kind of gives you uh, the total rainfall uh, for a community, and we look at about six different models because we need to know what is coming. We have the 12 stream gauges that, again, we're able to maintain on a regular basis that gives us information on the water levels, the rate at which the water level is rising, the precipitation amounts, the, the snow amounts, uh, temperature conditions, all of that is provided to us as with the stream gauge, and you can get all of that being in the office. Um, we also have snow sampling and ice monitoring, and I would uh, demonstrate it to you in the next slide. So here is the, the suite of products 
that, that we have. Um, we have water level sensors, flow level sensors, air and water temperature, precipitation, wind and snow data. That helps us in flood forecasting. It makes us uh, take informed decisions as to what the watershed and how the watershed is responding to these additional rainfall. So what you see here is a all weather uh, unit that it not only does the precipitation, but it's also able to give us the snow amounts. Um, uh, Emily DeClowitz does the calibration of these rainfall amounts. Just because you get the data being at the office doesn't mean it's accurate. So we need to make sure these equipment are calibrated. And we do that uh, at least twice in a, in a given year. We need to know what the snow conditions are because when it melts, the snow is going to contribute to the river, could result in riverine flight. So we need to know the snow amounts, and we do that two times in a month during the winter months. Additionally, we also pour the ice to get to know the thickness of the ice. The thickness is, is critical because you have a huge wave of water coming upstream due to melting temperatures or rain. That could dislodge the ice and it could jam somewhere. So we do uh, ice thickness monitoring as well, again, depending upon the time of the year and also following all the safety protocols. So I want to dig a little deeper to the kind of monitoring that we do in Wallaceburg. Um, so from left to right, I have broken down the operating criteria. Um, on the left, you see the water level at Wallaceburg and the rate of rise in Wallace Spring, and that's the parameter that we monitor on a constant basis. We also have the flow of Bear Creek, so that is what is coming in to the North Branch, so we need to know how much of it is coming to the North Branch. And if we divert it, how much are we reducing the flow coming into the community? Uh, maybe I'll just talk to it a little bit more. Uh, and the third condition that we look for is the observed condition. So these are measured actual measurements, and these are observed conditions based on our short-range forecast. So here I have the North Branch and the East Branch highlighted in blue, and the location of the stream gauge. So the stream gauge is located just downstream of the confluence in the community of Wallaceburg. And we are monitoring the levels, and any time it reaches 176 meters, we know there is minor flooding being experienced in our community. That is the height of the steel retaining wall that is protecting the community of Wallaceburg. And we compare it to the rate at which the water level is rising on the hour. So that we know that a huge wave is coming through. So it could quickly elevate these levels because it is rising at that rate now that's one of the parameters that we take into account when we operate the indicated floodway. In addition to that, we look at the flow of water, how much of the flow is coming through the North Branch to the Wallaceburg, and we also have some really good mapping that we have that gives us an idea of the extent of flooding in that community. That is actually an outline. I'm not sure why it's plain, but what the animation will show is corresponding to these levels, there are about six levels, what is the extent of flooding that will be experienced. So the greater the level, the bigger the floodplain. On top of all of these, we have a wet camera that is mounted on top of the stream gauge that constantly monitors not only the level, but also the snow, and also the rain. And it's very important because the rain that is being forecast is not the rain that you're actually receiving. Yes, your data, your stream gauge, precipitation gauge is going to tell you what rain amount is, but sometimes it's great to have a visual, especially when you're dealing with ice situations. Ice jams happen anytime, so having a camera is really a great tool for us to help us in our understanding of the flood conditions. The animations wouldn't play right on. Oh, you was? Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Okay, maybe you just got hired. <laughs> so, 
I know there's been a lot of interest in knowing what happened in the recent April events. So without going into the details of precipitation, I just wanted to highlight to you uh, a, a water level chart. And what you're seeing is for the last 10 years, starting from 2013 to 2023, we have the water levels in Wallaceburg at the stream gauge location that I've just shown you. So the highlighted area shows you the four different times recently we operated the McHugh Dam. So you can see February 21, 28, 2018. The level at Wallaceburg got to 6.2. So I know I said 176 earlier, so that equates to 176.2. The highest um, based on the recent event was 176.313. To 176.3, and that is when it's very high level in Wallaceburg. There's significant flooding happening, and we had to operate the McHugh floodway. We had to do it at other times as well, based on what we knew was coming in. Relative to that, what we have done is I have plotted the level that we observed during the April event, April 5th. So if you note the orange line shows a level of about 176.02, was slightly over that retaining wall in Wallaceburg. And you see, you can note that in the last 10 years, we had 207 days that we had noticed that water level being higher to that elevation. So I just wanted to demonstrate it to you that, yes, we had a lot of rain in this event that happened in April, but in terms of what levels we are normally used to see in the community. Yes, it's high, but we have seen worse. That is all I had for you today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, the January event that we had recorded 176.3, probably the highest we've seen. I was able to find uh, a video from the internet that shows the dam and this shows the flood rate. Uh, working so you can see that floodway is holding up the water pretty well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gary. It was a very well done presentation. And uh, does anybody have any questions for Gary at this time? Go ahead, Frank. The, just to, for clarification, the McHugh, the McHugh floodway is it primarily to uh, to protect Wallaceburg, or does it protect other communities? Downstream as well. Through you, Mr. Chair. It is primarily to protect the community of Wallsburg. I guess, I guess the experience that uh, we've had the four events over the most recent were four events, and when was what was the date of the most recent event when we had to uh, close the gates to divert the Sydney? So it was, uh, I believe, January 2021. 2021. Um, Kristen has a question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so in that last picture, you were showing the uh, the floodway. Yeah. Um, all that land around it, all those inside, that would be appropriated land around it. Is that correct? Yes, that is right. Yeah. And this is the same drainage system that goes through Chatham, that quite often have high. So this is a 7-kilometer channel, and it's just a straight channel that goes from upstream of the dam to the same place. Oh, no, so that's just, sorry, not that. And just all the flooding that all the problems of downtown Chatham. There is another uh, uh, channel uh, that, that there's a number of, a series of channels that's been administered and maintained by the Lower Thames Conservation Authority. So the, the design principle and the working principle is similar. But that's a, that's a totally different channel. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Don. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, lasting impacts of the drought carried on into the uh, 2023 year, even though I didn't have anything in the ground I was worried about, but I would offer that the uh, roughly three and a half to four inch rain that I received on my home farm at that time you didn't see the full impact of the water because the land took 
a good portion of that, and I watched the uh, the disk system um, behave very rapidly, and it was also absorbing. So my point is, are we prepared for the realities of uh, down the road where we might have more uh, moderate conditions on the soil? The absorption of water is not going to be capable, and then we get another three and a half. Or because last year I finished planning four rain events in ten days, I had 11 inches of water, and most of that water sat around for another 10 days after that because every channel was full, and it doesn't matter how many tile you got, there's not enough ditch flow. Uh, we got enough capacity to be able to hold back that kind of water with, without taking Wallaceburg off the map? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. The McHugh Dam itself is designed up to a regional storm event. So as long as the storm volumes are going to be lesser than approximately 260 millimeters over three to four days, we should be able to uh, use the McHugh floodway to to divert the waters into the St. Clair River. But anything more than that, it, the dam is not designed to do that. So in that case, we will just open up the gates and we will let the flood waters go downstream. It is not designed to do uh, a protection, offer a protection for more than a regional, more than a regional storm. But the other way of looking at it is through our policies and planning and regulations, we have taken a proactive approach in in not allowing properties within that within that regional storm uh, floodplain envelope. So I guess um, to the specific question of if, we're, if the dam would be able to handle a regional storm event, then it is not. But I guess there are other factors in place. Well. No sarcasm intended, but I have noted Mother Nature doesn't give a damn about policies, regulations, or papers. Uh, she's going to do what she wants to do. So you're telling me that we're good for up to about 10 inches of rain, and uh, I am seeing that we can get 10 inches of rain, but we're not getting it on a broad watershed. So uh, you're saying it's 10 inches over the entire watershed area that the dam can hold? Uh, Mr. Chair, it, this McHugh Dam is specifically designed to protect the community of Wallaceburg from flooding. So what we look at is the North Branch, right? The 2,700 square kilometers that is draining through the East and North Branches into the community. If your East Branch is going to generate more flow, then we are unable to do anything about it. So this is specific to the North Branch. So let us say hypothetically, if we get 10 inches of rain, in, in Brighton, the Bear Creek, then we'll be able to operate that and to put that flood waters out of the system. But yes, climate change is real, and I think that's what uh, we are discussing here. Climate change is real, so we need to be uh, prepared to deal with uh, those effects. Okay, I think uh, Bruce who had their hand up, I didn't say their hand up. Go ahead if you have a question. Oh, yes, okay, you got your hand flagged. Aaron and uh, Rhonda, go ahead if you have a question for Girish. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's Aaron Hall, and thank you for the presentation, Girish. Um, I always appreciate your uh, explanation about the, uh, the operating criteria for the MQ floodway. It's, uh, um, it's been helpful for me uh, to explain things, I guess, to, to people in, in Wallaceburg. Um, but just a quick question. I know you, you mentioned in your uh, your presentation about uh, you know the ultimate decision um, you know to operate the floodway uh, falls to, to our chair. Um, so what is our protocol, I guess, if uh, if our chair is not readily available to make that uh, uh, to make that call? Like maybe uh, you know as much as I'd like to have uh, Mr. Brown available twenty four hours a day, but uh, you know what if what if he's not completely available? And there's a situation where you know the operating criteria is met and a decision needs to be made and uh our chair is not available what what's the protocol to make that decision yeah no great question thank you so um as per the guidelines that we have um our general manager would be able to make that decision on behalf of the chair understanding the, uh, the recommendations from the staff 
excellent. That's uh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Rhonda, go ahead to start with your question, please. Sure. I just I just wanted to follow up with um, the previous gentleman. I'm sorry, I I didn't get his name, and it's hard when I'm not there. Um, I'm just I visit I visited some rural agricultural properties after the last significant uh, rainfall and. I, I kind of echo his sentiments that the ditches just weren't able to handle the rainfall. And I did notice there was significant um, water on um, agricultural properties that had winter wheat. And obviously, they're going to probably lose their crop. And I just want to make sure that I, I realize that, you know, there's provisions in place to look after Wallaceburg proper. But I just want to make sure that we're also... Um, being cognizant of what's, you know, around surrounding Wallaceburg, that these people that, you know, the what's going on with their properties is also being realized with the significant rainfall as well. And if if the water is being addressed on their on their agricultural land. So I just want to, you know, make sure that they're being included in in all of the policies and how you gauge when to open the dam and and whatnot. So I'm just trying to be a voice for some people that maybe not are being heard. That's all. Okay. Um, I want to ask uh, our general manager to comment on that, uh, Rhonda. Go ahead. So three, Mr. Chair. One of the challenges we have in dealing with the rural areas is that there's just a lack of vegetation, wetlands to hold back water naturally. Um, so that's why we work with a program called ALICE, uh, which is a stewardship program that will compensate farmers for taking acreage out of production. And then we would work with them to create a wetland or some type of control measure to help slow down the flows that will lesser the impact on their fields. Um, so there's been some pretty good projects around the watershed we've, we've undertaken. That's something we're going to be pushing as we go, particularly I, I'm aware of the areas in which you're speaking, where there's just literally no vegetation of any kind. The, 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 the drainage ditches are overwhelmed. There's no natural wetlands to hold back water anymore. It's just the nature of our watershed. Everything was drained at some point to increase acreage and yield. So that's one of the, one of the measures we'll take there. But we're constantly in contact with those individuals as well. Uh, so the board is aware. Um, when we go into a situation where we know there's going to be a potential for a flooding event, staff are on duty 24 hours a day. So it's not like we go home and don't worry about it. There's, there's a staff person who's on during the day, there's a staff person who's on during the night. Our uh, individual at the McHugh Floodway is on call 24-7. I'm on call. Like it's, it's a larger operation than just a 9 to 5, let's go home and not worry about it. So um, we are constantly monitoring. Um, this was my first go around with what I get. It's different watersheds do things differently. So if you look at the Grand River, for example, how they're set up differently is they have dams and reservoirs that hold back water that they can gradually release. We don't have that luxury. So to give you an idea, if we were to do that, say, on the East Branch of the Sydenham, you'd be looking in a neighborhood of a quarter of a billion dollars between dam construction, acquisition of properties, and everything else. Um, Unfortunately, that's just not going to happen now. So that's why we have to look at more natural stewardship initiatives to try and, and, and work with the agricultural sectors to help in those ways. So, um, anyways, that was just my two cents. Oh, uh, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, the question I have is in 2020, was there any activities that went on up at the Sault Ste. Marie? that affected the water levels south of Sault Ste. Marie because uh, some of the lakes north or Lake Superior didn't have the increase in water levels. And uh, there was information being released that uh, they were opening the, the waterways. Didn't seem to care that they were throwing more flood water down our way, but they wanted to make sure the one upstream uh, was okay. Is there any truth to that, Gersh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So something that I have to further investigate uh, um, on this one, but I'm aware that there's a constant operation that happens uh, through the uh, Lake uh, Superior, and it's part of the IJC grant plan to 
to uh, keep uh, the flood waters or keep the water level in check. So what happens in in, uh, in Sault Ste. Marie is going to affect some of the, the levels in the in the Saint Clair River and in the Lake Saint Clair. But I can I can dig deeper into that. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. It's a good conversation, and uh, certainly. Uh, climate change is going to be on everybody's minds going into the future. So, uh, Don, on that time here. Thank you. I uh, just want to point out that the Alice or alternative land use system is a poor substitute for non reality. The issue of wet and wait for it, land versus wetland, are two different things. The soils of Lambton County that I'm familiar with would fall under the wet, wait for it, land criteria, and our drainage system is built to help remove that water. There is no number of wetlands, and the Ellis system will not properly compensate anybody except on land that has already been predetermined to be too much of a slope or you can't have livestock on it because there's no money in livestock to be wandering around there to gather anything. So please do not hold that up as a holy grail that if we put wetlands in, we'd solve all this problem. You're not going to be able to do that because land is cha changing hands right now at either 30 to 40,000 an acre in the Lampton area. And if you get into Kent, you could be getting a little bit higher. And if you go north, it'll be getting a little higher too. So the reality of wetlands are wonderful if you've got a spot for them. Personally, most of the land that's in Lampton County should never go back there because we have only the class one, two, most of it left in Canada because there's houses going on it too fast. Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, I think I already had a mover and seconder for uh, Garish's report, so we're good on that. Um, I'll turn it to. Uh, Thank you. I'll go to six point one. Um, General Manager Ken's report, please. Uh, just if there's any questions from the board, go to anything. Else. Okay. Just um, I, I guess the the announcements of further legislation in the last couple of weeks is that. I, I'm not too familiar with the, any impact to to uh, the Conservation Authority and its demand on it. So just so the board is aware, I'm sure many of you are aware, the province um, kindly late on the Thursday night before the long weekend announced changes to the provincial policy statement as well as the growth strategy, so they're combining them into one. <laughs> there was nothing within that that explicitly talked about Conservation authorities. So the one area of impact was the natural heritage component, which is, and it was conveniently left out. So we don't know where that's going, still don't know where that's going. Um, what we have had indications from, particularly in the Greater Toronto Area, is that by removing conservation authorities from the natural heritage review, it's actually slowing things down because there aren't enough consultants to do the work. The municipalities don't have the capacity to do the work. And it's creating, like the building industry itself has gone to the province and said, you've made a terrible mistake by doing this. But we don't know what the impact's going to be. It's literally, they, it's highlighted in a yellow box and it's set off to the side to be dealt with at a future time. So we're not sure where that's going to go at this time. Okay, um, the only comment I have are, are all of the new board directors, have they had a chance to sit with you, Ken? And, uh, uh, except for Mr. O'Hara, because he's the newest of the yeah. new, but anybody, and then some weren't able to attend, so anybody who needs some time to sit down with me to ask any questions, I'm more than happy to go over an orientation of, for those who weren't able to participate in the session we had a couple of weeks ago. So, Ross, maybe, you know, you want to make an arrangement here and, and have Ken give you a... Possibly. I, I don't think I'm going to be here that long, actually, because... Uh, Brad intends on coming back as soon as he's as he's well. So okay. Or any of the other uh, new directors that haven't yet had a chance to uh, listen to Ken and his overview of the uh, conservation authority, it's a good good time to uh, make that happen. Okay. So I need a a mover for the uh, general.
Manager's Report that was dated April 11, 2023. Don McCallum and uh, Terry Burrow seconds. Thank you. Okay, item 6.2. Board of Directors received for information the report dated April 11 concerning uh, Conservation Ontario Annual General Meeting. Uh, mover, please. Steve Miller, seconded by Frank Kent. Okay, all in favor? Or any more? Oh, comment? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to acknowledge the place to see um, our staff being appointed to uh, Conservation Ontario committees and their active role in Conservation Ontario. So it's, it's nice to see that we're uh, being active at the provincial level. So it's appreciated. Uh, any further questions, comments? Any opposed? I'll take that as being carried. 6.3, a mover for the Board of Directors acknowledge the report dated April 12th on the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority vehicle replacements and approved transfer up to a maximum of $100,000 from the equipment reserve to purchase two new vehicles for the FCRCA fleet, and further that the Board of Directors approves the disposal of the 2013 Chevrolet Sierra fleet vehicle number 10 and the 2012 GMC Orlando fleet vehicle 11 from the FCRCA fleet inventory. A mover, please. Terry Burrell, seconded by Lori Scott. Okay, any questions or comments on that item? I'll go ahead, Greg. The only question I have is, um, are you confident that this will be enough money? I've seen municipalities are spending upwards of sixteen seventy to get a decent work vehicle. We, uh, <laughs> through you, Mr. Chair, we have no intention of getting the bigger vehicles right now. We're literally looking at whatever we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, the status of a couple of these two vehicles, particularly, they're just not roadworthy anymore. And... So we'd be looking something smaller scale, like a Maverick style pickup truck that are like in the, the $35,000 to $40,000 range. Um, but what our intent is, is seeing what the lag time is for um, quote unquote work truck, single cab, eight foot box pickup trucks. Uh, we know they are in very short supply. Um, Actually, this is a very hot topic at the Conservation Ontario meeting because no one can get vehicles. And so this is why we sort of decided that we looked at what our needs were. We know we can get smaller, lighter duty pickups or whatever we can get to serve those needs. So that's what we're targeting right now, not one. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on that item? I'll take that as being carried. Any opposed? Item 6.4. Board of Directors acknowledges the report dated March 29, 2023 and approves the recommendation to change the frequency of higher liability property inspections as outlined in this report. A mover, please. Frank, seconded by Terry Burrell. Any questions or comments on this report? Go ahead, Don. Just uh, wondering if there could be a more detailed uh, explanation of the uh, that would expand the table at the end of the uh, document that was supplied to us. Because uh, bottom line, uh, it doesn't matter uh, if uh, you decide something's a higher liability deal and you're going to do it biweekly. But it's also important of can you do something about it and are you able to uh, just what we're running into with the campground issue. Do we have the right uh, expertise to be able to satisfy the needs of uh, an insurance company or satisfy the needs of ensuring that that uh, shore line is not going to erode or something? I'm just looking for more detail on how these uh, issues are being delineated to be higher versus uh, minimal and stuff like that because uh, minimal liability can suddenly turn into a 
maximum calamity with the right weather conditions and all of a sudden you got fluid soil. So I don't think setting process is going to help us in the long run. Yeah. Greg, any comment on that uh, concern? Yeah, so this started a couple years ago with our walk of our properties with our insurance consultant. One of the recommendations was we needed a classification system for our properties um, and to create this sort of inspection guideline, which we did about a year ago. Uh, through that process, what, what we're talking about higher, moderate, and minimal, this is to do with our properties that we're inspecting. And we followed a guideline that was produced by Conservation Ontario. So higher liability includes things that have active recreation. So this is our, essentially our campgrounds. Uh, moderate means public access, but trail systems, washrooms, parking, nobody's there overnight. There's no full-time staffing at the site. And, and your minimal liability is essentially properties we own, but we don't promote or don't allow public access. So that's kind of the breakdown of how those were determined. What we've run into as this is a new policy, a new guideline, is that essentially we were trying to do bi-weekly inspections in the campgrounds. If you review our inspection scope, we're looking at upwards of 100 checklist items from every meter of trail to we're checking every site, parking lot, schools, and washroom buildings. And it's a very lengthy inspection process. can take a staff member a day or two. And we try to do it on a bi-weekly on a higher more frequent schedule. What we're realizing is all the time is going into inspection. What we're identifying in the inspection, we're running out of time to actually make the repairs. So what we're asking is we want to reduce the inspection frequency to monthly to allow staff to have the time to address those issues that arise from the inspection. We're, 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 we found we were heavy on inspection and running out of time to address concerns. I think that makes sense. Is, in, is bi-weekly in the frequency and certainly uh, any of the campground uh, supervision that's there if there's an issue that needs to be addressed immediately is going to uh, yeah and many issues, are, many issues are found without the inspection you know staff are just on site they find something they create a work order and they fix it the, the ideal was we wanted a more frequent inspection if we had the staffing resources we would love to do it at this higher rate it's not working in that we're not finding we have the time to do the repairs, so we would request that we can reduce the frequency of inspection to make sure we can meet that guideline and provide time to do repair. Sounds good. It's another set of eyes for for uh, looking at the uh, facilities. Okay. Um, did I call a question on that one? Uh, is anybody uh, opposed to that report? Okay. Move on to 6.5, that the Board of Directors acknowledges and receives for information the report dated March 24, 23, on board decision to maintain ownership of the Set Shetland Conservation Area. Go ahead, Lori. Oh, uh, mover. Are you moving that? Thank you. Seconded by Anne-Marie Gillis. Uh, questions? Alan Broad, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair. Can you just have staff forward that to our township office, please? I think they can forward it to their township office. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Greg, Thank you. Uh, launch that. No problem, Alan. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or concerns? Anyone opposed? I'll take that as being carried. Thank you. Item 6.6. .6. That the Board of Directors acknowledge the report dated March 31st regarding the Scotiabank investment types and further direct to move 25% of the portfolio each quarter to bring Scotia investment to be more strictly in line with eligible investments in the Municipal Act. A mover, please. Terry Burrell, seconded by Frank Kins. Questions? I know we've had uh, our uh, portfolio and advisors out uh, recently, and I know they were at the uh, foundation too as well, uh, giving their advice and uh, questions that uh, the previous chair had in regards to our investment portfolio. So, 
If everybody's good with that, any of oh, Don? The Municipal Act was passed in 2001. Uh, why did it take till 2023 to figure out that the uh, investments were wrong? And second of all, uh, is moving at 25%, that's going to take four shots to get in compliance. Is that quick enough, considering that we've ducked the reality of being out of scope with reality uh, for a while now? Is this going to happen quick enough? Because are we open to some kind of uh, penalty or uh, are we in uh, some situation that could be onerous to the organization? Yeah. Um, can you want to comment on that from uh, the director here? Yes, really, to share. Um, the first question I can't really address because I'm new here. Um, so I started to buy last year. I don't really know in the history or why, but this is what we um, found out um, that the social investment is not really strictly in line with the municipal act. And this is the action we're going to take to address it and to bring the portfolio basically more in line with the municipal act. Uh, the second question is uh, I consulted with the uh, investment advisor from Social Bank, and this is from his recommendation to do it through four, through four cultures, so that to move 25 percent um, in each culture, so that we can basically absorb any fluctuation from the market. To avoid a sudden change of that. So I don't know if that satisfies your question, Don. But uh, not really, to be honest. But the uh, because it's great to talk to an investment advisor. But if I was an investment advisor, I'd tell you exactly the same thing. Because I want to keep your business as long as possible. But the issue is, have we consulted? with government officials to say, by the way, we're you're now aware of this problem and uh, we will be solving it. Is this timeline adequate to make these changes in? I've been down this road before and it essentially costs an organization its uh, constitution and its uh, longevity. Well, essentially, I believe we're in a low risk investment portfolio that uh, with, with the uh, Ford's investments, uh, they're not designed for growth, and I think the securities that are we invest under is is we take that under the advisement of the uh, portfolio manager and and our staff. So uh, I guess we can look at it in future as to what it is, but if we're governed by what the municipal act is, is what I'm hearing in the in what we can invest in when it comes to risk. So. Greg, do you have a question? I just um, a comment is just, that, just to clarify that this is being done 25 percent each quarter, not annually. So this will be done within a year, the calendar year, which I find uh, would be proper and mm -hmm. have it all resolved within a year because it's 25 percent each quarter rather than an annual. It will be all resolved by the end of this year. So we we'll move 25 percent each quarter, and then. Uh, be fully resolved by the end of this year, and um, the risk, um, Mr. Chair is right on the risk, it's a low risk investment, it's all bound. It is some bonds, uh, like about 50% of the bonds is global bonds, that's the portion that's for outside the act. And then what we're doing is bring a 25% of that to uh, maybe bonds, that specific bond within the act, so that we can. Um, like the expectation is towards the end of the year, the interest rate should like, go lower, and then we can still take advantage of that to recoup some of the investment loss we had from the last year. Okay, that's been moved and seconded. Then, did I get a move on that? Uh, I think I did. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I think that is uh, being carried. Any opposed? Okay, 6.7, Board of Directors acknowledges the report dated March 30 on water and erosion control infrastructure projects and approves the projects submitted for funding in 23, from 2023 through 2024 and further will assist 
staff in obtaining matching funds where required to support these projects upon confirmation of funding approval. So that follows uh, Gary Schiff's report. Any questions? Mary Lynn? Yes. Uh, just motion. Oh, the move that uh, moved by Mary Lynn McConnell, seconded by Lori Scott. Barry, did you have a question or were you just seconding? Okay. Uh, go ahead, Ross. <coughs> New here. So when you're applying for matching funds, or is that from government grants, or where is that? That's, uh, I'll let uh, Gary answer that. It's the WICA program, which the federal government. Uh, for you, Mr. Yeah. Uh, it is a provincial funding program, and it stands for Water Erosion Control Infrastructure. It's a $5 million funding pot available uh, for conservation authorities, so 36 conservation authorities for their erosion control and dam, dam structures. So it's a provincially governed uh, program. And I recently got uh, recruited into, into the committee, so I do have some inside stories on, on what, the, uh, what really happened in the committee. Uh, so yeah, it's a provincially run program. Uh, what we aim to do is uh, we, we get uh, funds for shoreline projects or big dam improvement projects. For example, uh, this year uh, we applied for the City of Sarnia Shoreline uh, Improvement Project and also to Seagull Park Shoreline. And these are the projects that the municipality has already contacted us and said, hey, can you look for money for our project? And, and that is what gets into, into the Wesley program. But there are other projects as well, like general improvements to the McHugh Dam and, and uh, general improvements to the McHugh Floodway that are uh, applied for as well. So we get 50% of the money from the provincial government, and the rest 50% will be shared uh, with the municipalities. Curious, what is the federal program that we sometimes tap into? The federal program is a disaster mitigation adaptation fund. It's a fund that we initially applied for in 2018, and we have been provided about $8 million in federal contribution over 10 years. So it's, a ten, it's kind of like a 10 year program and we apply for reimbursement based on how much money we spend on a yearly basis. Okay. And the two mixed up, which is the provincial side. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on that report? Any opposed? I'll take that as carried. Item 7.1, the consent agenda that the Board of Directors approves the consent agenda and receives the accompanying items 7.1A through 7.1L as information. Uh, anyone want to address any of those items? Greg, go ahead, Jay. I'm just moving it. Oh, moved by Greg Grimes, seconder, John Brennan. Any questions with uh, A through L? I'll take that as being carried then. All in favor. 8.1, the Board of Directors acknowledge and receive information for information the correspondence dated April 5th from Chad Anderson regarding agricultural land stewardship and best farming practices. A mover, please. Moved by... Don McCabe, seconded by Terry Burrell. Questions, comments? Go ahead, Don. Chad makes uh, some excellent points within this letter, and I would like to uh, ask that the authority review the uh, land uh, agreements that you're offering and uh, uh, make sure that uh, we're going to be uh, um, accommodating the uh, points that Chad has pointed out in this letter because the issue of lime is paramount to healthy soils and having the right pH in the soil, all the rest of it. His point is well made in there and if you're going to be out uh, promoting healthy soils and promoting incentives and cover crops, all the rest of it, 
you should not be acting like most of the other uh, renters in the landscape in the area. Uh, how much can I make this year? Because I'm working with the uh, uh, different funds, which will remain nameless, but uh, are essentially raping and pillaging the landscape. So I would like to see action taken on this letter. Um, Al, I see your hands up, but uh, I'm going to ask Ken uh, to comment on that. So through you, Mr. Chair, just for the newer members, we have created a committee to review our agricultural contracts and rental contracts to ensure that proper practices in terms of rehabilitating soils and everything else is included in the agreements. So that's the action. We've already taken that step. Uh, because that was raised to us last year with this, this issue. So we are, and I believe uh, Mr. Broad will be sitting on that committee, um, uh, Terry Burrell is sitting on that committee as well, and uh, Emery Hutzka is on that committee. So they're bringing their knowledge and expertise to help uh, improve our rental agreements to ensure that um, the soils are taken care of because we have acknowledged that as a challenge. So. I guess I can just add that I believe it was five year leases that we entered into with all these uh, tracks. So I don't, we must be about halfway through now, aren't we? Or was it just last yeah. year? Yeah. Okay. Al, do you have any uh, questions or comments? Yes, I do. And thanks, Chairman. And uh, I would ask that our, my fellow director there, McCabe, if he would uh, maybe should get some accurate information. What really happened here was. Uh, the renter came in, he outbid everybody else, and then uh, instead of applying Lyme on year one of a five-year contract, which he would have got his return back, he waited till year two to investigate putting the Lyme on and then wanted to have an extension. So, uh, you know, the facts are that he came in here, he outbid everybody else, and then all of a sudden found out they need to apply Lyme. So uh, I think... Uh, what went on there, um, I think the board made the proper decision by not extending it. And by all means, I think the committee will make sure that uh, we have some uh, things in place for the next time this contract comes up. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a mover and seconder on that already. And uh, any opposed? I'll take that item as being carried. 8.2, that's a Board of Directors acknowledge and receive for information the correspondence dated March 27th from Gordon McFoston regarding the seasonal campground rules and regulations pertaining to decks and other permanent structures. A mover, please. Gloria Scott. Seconder. Gary Westgate. Any opposed? No, that uh, item will okay, we'll be. Uh, we have another one too, 8.3. Board of Directors acknowledge and receive for information the correspondence dated March 31st from Alan and Margaret Lester regarding the seasonal campground rules regulations pertaining to deck <coughs> and other permanent structures. A mover, please. Russell Hare, seconded by Terry Burrell. Thomas, and I think we've dealt with this already, so. I'll take that as being carried. Any opposed? Okay. New business. Item 9. New business. Any new business to be brought forth? Christine Rodriguez, go ahead. Kristen. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to inquire about um, conservation of land. In the jurisdiction of think their conservation authority. I understand that like, all conservation authorities in Ontario have to provide mapping in, in details of those lands for the government, and I believe under their new Bill 23, Bill Homes Faster, uh, they feel like a lot of these lands were um, purchased through funds provided from the Ontario government, so they feel like they have. Um, the ability to possibly take some of those land back, lands back to um, get more homes built. Um, I believe it's until the end of 24 that you have to supply that information. I guess my question is, I, I obviously I don't know how many land you own, description 
and none of that stuff, but in theory. Um, if there were some, would it, Chris, uh, I guess there's a, a volunteer I'm thinking out loud, ahead of the cart, probably, um, that some of these lands um, might get recouped, possibly within our jurisdiction. Um, by the Ontario government, uh, should there be some want for development on those lands, um, would they be better projected going into possibly municipal uh, hands where they could be better protected, where they seem more vulnerable um, to government expropriation? If that makes any sense, kind of what I'm saying out there. Okay, um, I'm going to defer to. Ken again on this. I believe that mapping does exist of all of our properties and we did have to or I don't know if it's happened yet as to when we have to submit uh, properties to uh so three yes, that's correct. So three, Mr. Chair, that is correct. By the end of by Jan end of twenty twenty four we have to have submitted. So we've actually we have staff working on that right now. Um, assessment making assessments of all of our properties, doing better analysis of what's there. Um, ultimately, the challenge, so you have to look at this as collectively in the province of Ontario, the 36 conservation authorities are the second largest landowners. So that's sort of where the province is coming from. The bigger issues of their view is strictly looking at the GTA. Um, so in most of our cases, our properties simply aren't <coughs> developable. There's not any... Um, Servicing opportunities, there's not any other you know, wetlands, forested areas, that type of thing. But it's a broader scale of properties owned by authorities near major metropolitan centers. And since none of our centers have been identified as being major metropolitan centers, I think the risk is fairly low. Um, we still have advantages of hanging on to land that municipalities might not necessarily have. But if you look at what they've done recently with um, Ordering Wellington County, Guelph to expand outside their urban boundaries. Anyways, I don't. I think we're basically going to be the same amount of risk um, in terms of what the province decides to do. So currently, now we're we're, we're fine. Um, <laughs> but we'll have to wait and see. I guess I'm just worried about more of the longer term picture yeah. and being able to protect those lands better. Um, Mr. Chair, I think. Okay. Um, that almost. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Laurie. Oh, Laurie, go ahead. You got your hand raised. I do. Thank you. I'd just like to make a couple comments. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our general manager Ken for taking the time to talk to both Pat and I on on kind of where you know our organization is going. It was extremely important, and it was it was really it was really well done. I also stepped into um, the new board directors. Um, introduction as well, and I was very impressed with what was said and done because I wish that I'd have had that um, when I had come in, and uh, it, it made a lot of sense, and it gave everybody an opportunity for questions. And I just want to thank Ashley too because she's always making sure I'm at the meetings, and she's also making sure that I'm informed. And I really appreciate that because sometimes I get a little, shall we say? Um, in a different direction. So I, I just want to say thank you because it's really important to me that this group works together and appreciates the staff that we have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lori. And uh, I guess the only other comment I'll make is uh, we have the uh, Sydenham River canoe race coming up here in less than about 10 days. And uh, I would encourage, I know Emery and myself are going to go in as uh, representatives, but if anybody else is into the canoeing, okay. John? Bring, uh, bring a cold spare boat, Mr. John. I was, just, I was looking at you. <laughs> but uh, no, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll hit a good streak of weather again when that uh, canoe is on. And, uh, Thank you for anyone who has sponsored me in that, and uh, hope, hope that to be a good day. Um, we've got the other items here, which are news clippings and the uh, updated mem membership list. Hopefully, Ashley, have you got everybody's 
emails and phone numbers. That will change again yeah. uh, now that we have uh, Councillor Raw here with us. Okay. Uh, having said that, I'm looking for a uh, mover for adjournment. Anne Marie Gillis. Oh, Adam. Hi, Adam. I didn't see you there for a while. Adam Jones. Yeah. Oh, and right after this, we have uh, uh, the source protection meeting. So maybe uh, we can, if anybody needs a break, we'll break for five minutes and, and be back here to do the uh, source protection uh, report. Okay, so. Hang on there, all you people that are zooming in on us. We'll be uh, back in order in five minutes. 